push down at, on, onto the, the phone without any user knowledge or consent. Um, you described how your GPS and other location information can be accessed. You, you, people do get told that you, there's no way to opt out of the government lo locating you. Um, if you were king for the day, and you could force the smartphone providers to change their systems, and you could force the carriers to change their, their technical systems, what would you do to protect people's privacy and security better in, in the smartphone environment? Yeah, so I, I think the one thing that I would probably focus on, so I would think there's two things. One, one is um, for retroactive request for information, I would uh, push on in your broader retention of this, right? So um, I think, uh, you know, you've talked about cricket um, and how they don't log information. So they don't, if you don't have that information, law enforcement can't go and get that information. So you're, you're saying that AT&T's seven-year long retention period is, is too much? It might, I mean, you know, you, you, might not, I mean, you guys use AT&T? Seven years, you go cool with that? No. <laughs> well, what, what else uh, for everyone on the panel? You know, what, what, what other pressure can consumers put here and what other pressure should consumers put here? So we talked about how the mobile carriers should be more transparent about how long they retain data and shouldn't retain it for as long as they do. Um, you know, we've praised companies for putting out transparency reports that say how many times they get different kinds of requests. Google and Twitter have done that. Um, we praise Twitter because when they get subpoenas for customer records, they notify the users so that they will have an opportunity to challenge that in court, although courts uh, have sometimes said that users don't even have standing to do that. What should we as you know, customers and consumers be pushing um, these companies to do more? Well, so I would say for this crowd, we as uh, researchers and developers and actors, and whatever we call ourselves, uh, uh, highlighting some of these, these activity points, this collection of information, the transmission of information, um, you know, finding tasteful ways to demonstrate privacy exposure so that when you don't have senators, but like you might want to show that you know, the senator, when they're using their phone, and who they're in their location, when they're going to the strip club, uh, you can make that case. I think you know, senators are going to be, uh, their, their eyes are going to be open and they're going to want to find ways to um, protect that information. That's typically how um, I find that, that people pay attention to issues is when it affects them. And so uh, as, as people that are very capable, probably much more so than anyone at the panel, I would say you know, if you have ways to demonstrate how sensitive information is being um, stored and securely transmitted to people that would, and, and legally, uh, and, and legally demonstrate this stuff, um, and generally would surprise most average consumers. I think that's a really good use of your time. I second that. So I think the most perverse aspect of, of the tracking debate and this and the surveillance state we live in, the really the thing that bothers me the most, I think, is really twisted, is that if you get arrested and the government uses location information to find you or to build a case, you'll be told about it. If the government is reading your emails and somehow they find something you know, uh, problematic there and they use it to build a case and they arrest you and prosecute you, in the course of your prosecution, you will learn that the government is digging through your most private sense of affairs. But if you're innocent, if you've committed no crime and the government never charges you with anything, in so many of these requests, in so many of these forms of surveillance, you never know about it. If Google hands over your search logs, you don't know about it. If the government obtains your cell tower location data, if they look through your emails, if they find out your credit card transactions or your public transportation records or your easy pass toll booth records, you never learn about it. And I think it's really, really messed up that the innocent in this country can be subject to surveillance and, and, and not know that, that it occurs. And I want to be clear that under US law, for most forms of surveillance, Unless the government specifically obtains an order prohibiting disclosure, companies are free to tell you. They just don't do it. It's bad for business. They don't want to scare their customers. They don't want to worry people. And frankly, they get no benefit out of doing so. And I understand that. I understand why the companies don't want to do that. And I think we should change the law so that the government is required to tell you uh, when they obtain your stuff. But that doesn't mean they need to tell you the day that they request your records. Certainly. You know, that could frustrate a legitimate investigation. But at some point, whether it's six months or a year or two years down the road, at some point, you should be told the government is looking through your personal private files. And right now, you just don't know.
I think that's a really excellent point. When you start seeing numbers like 1.3 million you know, records being accessed, the number of those people who are innocent has actually got to be quite substantial. And I just wanted to build off of Chris's point by talking about the mechanics uh, by which the government gets these orders. Even when they go to court um, to get an order as sometimes required by the law, they generally do so in proceedings where the government is the only party, right? The government goes and says, I need this surveillance order to be granted uh, for an investigation. And the defendant, of course, isn't told that they're about to be subjected to surveillance for good reason, right? The investigation is not going to be effective if the person is told that their cell phone is about to be tracked. Um, but unfortunately, what this does is it subverts the adversary process, right? In general, judges get to listen to both sides of arguments before making decisions. And um, the surveillance requests the government has submitted have gotten broader and broader and broader over time, and the judges don't have anyone on the other side to help them understand it. So, um, for example, there was a case we uncovered called the United States versus Soto, which was in Connecticut, in which it turned out, it ended up being an example of a case where the government submitted a request to engage in tracking, not just of the one individual they thought had engaged in wrongdoing, but of everyone else who had called that person's cell phone which ended up being about 180 other people. Um, and the judge simply signed off on this order. Um, but these orders aren't clear, clearly written. And they're, they're quite confusing and difficult to understand. And I think the way in which they're gotten just by the government without anyone else in court to make the arguments in favor of privacy is, is one of the reasons we've seen such a rampant expansion of surveillance. So now it's just those of us for whom one hour of this is not enough. <laughs> Uh, and we'd like to invite questions and comments because we don't have a microphone for that. So those shielding of companies from liability for disclosure of information about their customers. I, I think you're talking about the FISA amendments. Yes, yeah, so yeah, about the FISA. Well, yeah, some. I mean, you know, the, the ACLU has a broad constitutional challenge to the legality of the FISA amendments. Amendments Act that's going to be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court at the end of October. Uh, I would just say, if you want more information about that, there is another ACLU panel at this conference tomorrow um, with my colleague Jamil Jaffer moderating, and he is going to be arguing that case, and he's the real expert on this. We'll also have um, you know, Kim Bamford and Bill Biddy in the NSA. Without getting into, just to respond, without getting into the legal issues, what I can tell you is that the carriers don't like the idea of being liable for their illegal assistance of the government. Um, unsurprisingly, right? And they lobbied extremely hard to get that law passed. They spent a lot of money. Carriers have still insist they didn't do anything, but they also spent lots of money to, to lobby for its passage. And you see, after those lovely lawsuits against the carriers, that they've insisted even more on lots of things in writing, saying, you know, we're not liable for any assistance. We provide, you see, in the recent um, cybersecurity legislation that's been proposed and revised several times, still hasn't passed. The key issue in the current cybersecurity debate is how much information can the communications companies provide about your information? How much of your information can they give the governments for cybersecurity purposes without ever being liable uh, and, and being sued by the customers for doing so? NSL's national security letters with respect to obtaining information, telecommunications, and otherwise? The use of national security letters yes. to yes, obtain so information? The question. the question was about the use of national security letters. As the, the non-lawyer, I can I can tell you a little bit. So the the NSLs were NSLs were expanded under the Patriot Act to uh, allow the government to go to telecommunications companies and obtain certain kinds of customer records. And there's been significant debate about what the government can get with an NSL to say an internet provider. So there was a, a memo written by the Office of Legal Counsel, which is sort of the the internal lawyer within DOJ that, set, that specified what the FBI could and couldn't ask for um, with an NSL. And the, the issue that there's considerable debate around is whether they can ask for transaction records from the internet providers, which is basically who you've emailed. Who you've emailed and when you've emailed them. Um, companies generally, the, the NSLs that are sent are usually gagged, are usually sealed, so companies are prohibited from disclosing uh, that they receive them. There have been a couple cases where companies have fought uh, to try and notify their, their users. Um, but what we can talk about, what companies are able to talk about, even if they cannot comment on the NSLs they've received, companies can comment hypothetically
hypothetically about what they would hand over if they received an NSL. And so Facebook is the only company that I know of that has gone on record to say that if they receive an NSL, they will not hand over communications metadata. They will just hand over your name. And Long ago and far away, when the Supreme Court held that you have no privacy interest in your bank records, um, someone tried to argue that the personal checks that he had written to the bank uh, were his financial records, and therefore the government couldn't simply subpoena them from, from the bank because he had a Fourth Amendment interest in them. They needed a warrant based on probable cause. And the Supreme Court said, sorry, no go, you're out of luck. These aren't your records. They are the records that you have voluntarily disclosed to a third party, and therefore you have no privacy interest. The Supreme Court extended that rationale to the phone numbers you dialed, a case called Smith v. Maryland. So if, if you type in a phone number, right, or if you, if you call a phone number or someone calls you, the Supreme Court has said you have no privacy interest in that. Um, if this doctrine is carried to its extreme, that means that in the digital era, we will have no privacy in anything anymore, because if you use Gmail or Yahoo for your email, it is all stored by a third-party company, all of your location data is stored by a third-party company. Um, I, I, you know, I think courts looking at the extreme consequences of that argument push back on it. So for example, um, one federal appeals court has ruled, for example, that you have a privacy interest in the content of your email even though a third party has access to it. Um, but this is the government's primary argument about location information as well. You know, you, you, you chose to carry a cell phone. I remember reading one government brief in particular in which they said that anyone who doesn't want to be tracked, there's a simple solution for those people. They can leave their cell phones at home, right? And you sort of like wonder what world the government anticipates that we will inhabit if we don't want to be subject to 24 hour tracking. Um, but this is, this is one of the major arguments the government makes. Our requests, which are going to focus on the use of automatic license plate readers, um, that's actually happening this upcoming week on, on Monday. Um, and you know, I think that is the next big place that this is going to go, because in major cities like Washington, D.C., in New York, it is essentially possible to enter or exit the city in a car without having your license plate recorded. It used to be that that information was then discarded after some period of time. Now that stuff is being um, you know, kept indefinitely and pooled into these uh, you know, state or regional or federal databases. Um, we don't know where the money is coming from. It's probably coming from you know, various federal government sources that are like pushing out the dissemination of this relatively inexpensive technology, right? Um, and so you can never just think, okay, we're gonna solve the cell phone or car location tracking problem, right? There's always going to be, it, it, it's, it is an internal game of whack-a-mole. There's always gonna be another field of play and, and that's the next one. Could you just comment on, so we've kind of used terms like the government and law enforcement and tracking and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of important to think about how this stuff actually happens, right? So we have a bunch of different entities from the NSA to the FBI to local law enforcement. And they, they have, they also go to conferences like, like this. And in the same way that it's a false um, descriptor to think that everyone in this room has a complete command of all the possible tools out there and research tools with, with security, you know, with regards to security. And um, it's also kind of, it's, it's also important to note that long, so there might be some guy in some office in you know, Arkansas that happens to have, uh, happens to need location information for a particular case and happens to either have attended a conference and know how to get uh, to the Sprint um, API to get that data or happens to know a buddy at a different, that's you know, managed to get location information from a different source like OnStar or whatever, and he's gonna go through that process for his case. Right? So it's not this like, you know, 
this uh, big entity with a set of rules. It's that people are trying to solve a case and they're going to find and get information in whatever way they can, right? And they're going to follow standards sometimes. Sometimes they're going to go around it. Sometimes they have a buddy that's a PI that can get it for them, or sometimes they have a relationship with a particular ISP that they've done in a previous case and they can call them back up. So it's important to understand the human element and, and try to think about this stuff because it's not a blanket um, kind of entity trying to think of, 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 of a, a, a framework. It's literally, I, I need this data, I'm gonna go and get it from wherever I can, and it's low-hanging fruit, right? So like, since, since you know, the spread is currently in the Amazon and location tracking, in the sense that you know, everyone knows about them and they can just go to, go to them. And so if you have a target that's a Sprint customer, you're like, hell yeah, I know the URL for that thing. And I'm going to go and you know, buy some, buy some, some GPS. But I should also clarify. So we have, what we know is about 1.5 million requests. So um, most of the carriers responded to Mr. Markey and gave numbers. T-Mobile refused to give Markey numbers. And then about a week later, they said they got about 190,000 requests um, that year. So we, we know it's about uh, 1.5 million requests. Those are only law enforcement requests. That doesn't include a single intelligence agency request for the simple reason that the phone companies are not allowed to talk about those requests. They can at least give us a number. What they can't tell us the specifics of the requests they receive from police, particularly in the case they're ongoing, but they can just tell us a number. But the requests that they receive uh, in national security cases, the assistance they provide to NSA, that's deeply classified. And so, although well, we've learned a fair amount about an NSA setting up shop inside the telecoms, right? Well, we know that. Well, we, we know that the telcos gave wholesale access, tel several telcos gave wholesale access to NSA. We know that the FBI placed, or sorry, the, the, the FBI paid the phone companies to place telco employees in FBI teams so they could provide easy access, uh, easy, quick access to data. Um, the FBI agents were writing down the names of people on PowerPoint, or on um, post-it notes and then passing the phone guys to see if there's anything suspicious there. But what I want to emphasize here is what we do know is only about law enforcement and the intelligence stuff is likely far scarier and happening more, it's more likely to be in a wholesale manner. And the limiting factor here is not gonna be the technology, it's gonna be the law and the policies. So about uh, four years ago, I got a copy of some slides from a British surveillance company called Fort Glenn. Um, and they provide an interface, a layer to Google Earth that um, telcos can install and, and, and work with, with the government to provide it. And their demo, used real-time data in, from Indonesia. So they were giving, the, the Indonesian authorities who purchased the software basically had a Google Earth interface and they could zoom in and see dots on a map of 60 million cell phones. 60 million cell phones, dots on a map of Google Earth. To me, that's terrifying. To the guys at Fort Glenn, they're proud of it. Um, the, you know, the wonders of their technology. But what you need to understand here is the limitations are not on what is technically possible. It's what the phone companies are giving and what the government is asking for and the government feels comfortable doing. Uh, and also, of course, US law only really protects the communications of US persons, if, if then. Um, and anyone who's abroad, um, their data is really up for grabs. And, and so we should assume that there are millions more requests, million more, millions more of requests that we will never know about. That's what we're talking about here from the carrier, right? So if you're still using the switch network or you know, T-Mobile's network or whoever, you're still Towers and the towers can identify you, which is accessible to law enforcement. So perhaps you then turn off, you know, data plans and, and this kind of stuff, and only use it on Wi-Fi. Sure, maybe, uh, but that's that's less to do with the ROMs themselves. The other thing to think about, and um, it's kind of this uh, kind of double-edged sword with, with a lot of custom ROMs, is one, you often use um, untrusted sources and you expose yourself to the other security risks, and two, you don't often get the latest patches, right? So things like um, you know some of the all search stuff or some of the um, kind of the new, new features in Jelly Bean won't be available in um, some of the custom ROMs. So it's kind of like you uh, use your own risk if you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you might actually inadvertently um, be creating a different type of attack surface, um, protecting about protecting from the ones you know about and introducing ones you don't. I mean, what I'll say is that right now the, the laws of physics don't really really allow you to communicate with the cell phone company and not have the tower know approximately where you are. Right. There, there's no way to hide the direction you're sending your signals uh, from, from, from the tower. If, if you're using mesh networking or you're bouncing your, your signal through some other device, then you're, you're doing that. Um, but 
the tower is always going to know which direction it's receiving the signal from. It's going to know the approximate strength of the signal. I mean, there's some degree of approximation that the tower can, can, can guess. So, so the, the Ninja guys just did their sort of fun little experiment, which is, I think, a good example of how to decentralize, for example, um, off the tower. And so maybe that's the way to go. Um, I recently had an idea which, if anyone wants to implement, would be awesome, um, which is um, who's familiar with Google Share Moxie's uh, thing that lets you share cookies? Um, so, like, so, that, like, so um, all four of us would be using Google Sharing at the same time. Anytime Google would not know who, which one of it is, it is making the request or visiting the web page. Um, with software now, for soft and software radio now, you can do some stuff, some fun stuff around swapping uh, your your MZ and your your um, kind of your, your SIM card kind of uh, profile. And so one fun experiment could be getting uh, 50 people in this room to sign up to a uh, all you can eat carrier. So like something like um, uh, what's what's the one called Straight Talk. Fifty dollars unlimited. Um, data and limited voice. So you get 50 of those plans, and you then randomly assign an NZ for each call. So you can, ne you can never know which of those 50 people are making that call at any given time, and therefore not know who is at what location. Right? So you, don't, you lose the ability to take any inbound calls, maybe you can solve that through some, some other back channel. Um, but you could try to do things like um, get around this problem that Chris highlighted, which is how do you maintain a uh, connection to the existing infrastructure and still protect your location information? service, uh, is that Huddle or Hangout for you? Whatever it's called. Um, I've been asking Google for months about what their intercept capabilities are, and they won't comment. They just say they comply with all lawful requests, and they push back on requests they think are inappropriate. Again, I, I think that it, the companies like Google, particularly companies like Google that, that claim to put their users first and blah, 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 um, I think that they have an obligation to at least be upfront and say, this is what we can do. And if, if they can, in fact, record your video chats in real time and later provide that information to the government, I think they should tell us. Um, certainly, given that Google Voice is communicating on the, the regular telephone system, I suspect that they're required. Uh, I suspect they're, they fall under the yet, that's, that's my guess. Um, but they just won't talk about it, and I, I think that's highly problematic. So, you're a comment about, you, you just did a post about Skype as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been so much speculation over the past few months. But it's been growing in the last couple of weeks about what Skype can and can't do. And the company is very careful in, in, in statements. That they appear to be written by a combination, a hybrid team of lawyers and, and PR, which is the worst combination. Um, <laughs> they say that they use encryption. We don't know very much about how they do the key exchange and certificates and other things. I mean, I personally wouldn't use Skype for anything that I, that I didn't want the government to hear. So we have about five more minutes.